I think I, I think I got interested in in filmmaking in general, kind of in in junior high school, and I would um, just kind of uh, fool around with video cameras and Super 8 cameras and and uh, make some junky homemade movies. And um, at that time, I don't think I had a, a very good sense of it as as a a visual art or any kind of special taste for it. And then in the, over the next couple of years, I got um, I, I start well. I started um, uh, volunteering on student films at USC, and um, that's also when I met Ryan. And uh, that that was when I got really interested in camera and realized there was uh, something more and something more interesting that can be done visually. Are there are there kind of go to films or or other DPs works that? That, that you return to for kind of inspiration? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a fan of so many different kinds of things, but, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's probably kind of a, a cliche, but, uh, but it's true for me too. I mean, Roger Deakins has just been, uh, I've just been a fan of his and, and it's been, you know, such an influence even from, um, Kind of the even from the beginning of when I was getting started, really thinking about lighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm also a huge, also a huge fan of Gordon Willis. Just just to name a couple, but those are some of the, you know, the more influential. Uh, and also, I think I read a quote from you where you were talking about your approach to lighting and and learning not to be afraid of having the actors be in darkness for a period of time and, and, you know, Gordon Willis is kind of the, the master, <laughs> the renowned. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that even, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's hard as a DP to remember it. And then I think also, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing with, with directors, um, you know, R Ryan less so, but, but, you know, even still because he, uh, um, you know, just, just he gets involved in, in the film and whatnot. I, I do think there's a lot of directors that have really good taste in lighting in general when they're watching movies, but then when they're making their movie, they kind of forget because everything's happening all at once and they're thinking about 8 million things and lighting isn't necessarily the main one and they, they tend to lean towards this kind of overly safe stuff to the point where, I mean, something that's not even actually daring they, they might view it as, you know, unsafe or, you know, um, or, or, you know, they might view it as too daring and it's not even daring at all. It's like, well, you know, somebody literally just walks through the darkness for half a second while they're walking or <laughs> whatever, you know. Um, uh, so that, you know, that's something that's, you know, a line you're always walking of, of um, not, not that I'm trying to always make people dark or something, but, by any stretch, a lot of times I'm the one that's saying, no, we need a little more time to make sure you can see people, but when it's right or when it makes sense or when it looks cool, you know, or, or if it's the, or if you have a scene where there's nothing interesting about it and there's an idea to make it interesting, that's, that's to make it a little daring or something. Um, then so, sometimes there's a line you walk of, of, um, you know, making sure that the people are okay with it and how much do you want to, push and all that and I think that that's I think that to a large extent that's why things tend to look um homogenous and, and there's a certain way that things look isn't because of it's not even because of somebody's taste it's because of the, kind of the way the whole system works mm -hmm. well is there tell me about that line because obviously as a cinematographer and and our best filmmakers I'm sure all feel like this they they, they want to push the boundaries they want to do something new show something as it's never been shown before but not mm -hmm. not at the sacrifice of the the content uh it, yeah. it it needs to bring forth the best of the content is that a difficult line to kind of toe yeah absolutely i mean i think it's i think it's a it, it's a two-pronged difficulty because one it's unbelievably difficult just to even be able to to do it in an artful way at all and then if you can, it's not like you have a completely free hand. There's a whole political world that might that you might have to push, you know, push up against. 
And, um, you know, I mean, I, I think in terms of forgetting the political part and just the how do you do it part, um, I think that, uh, you know, every, everybody's got a different approach. I'm just talking about my specific one, not that it's the right one, but, uh, you know, if you're trying to be yourself, um, uh, I think the, the big thing is um, making it part of the story. You know, I mean, there's scenes where, um, you know, like if, I, if I'm working on something that's, that's, that's more of a, um, you know, let's say, let's say it's a, a comedy and it's a, it's a long dialogue scene with people not moving very much, then I'm going to want to put really nice loving light on the faces. I'm not going to want to try to make them in silhouette because it's for a long time. So you would just keep cutting back to the silhouette, <laughs> you know, in a comedy, which would be bizarre. But, you know, on the other hand, if it's a scene where, you know, it's all action and people are moving through spaces, you know, and to some extent, even if it's in a comedy, as long as it goes with the scene, I mean, you can have, have it go through, um, darkness. And, and, and I think that, um, I think that the fact that we're specifically talking about darkness kind of shows, uh, a little bit the mania because there's all kinds of different lighting that you do to make it interesting or different. Like, you know, whether it's flares or, or, you know, you could, something could be too bright, it can be blown out or backlight versus front light or, um, you know, and as, as you use all these different things, for some reason, the, the very specific one of all the different tools that's, uh, um, something that sometimes evokes a knee jerk reaction is if the front of faces are, are dark. Mm-hmm. Well, I would uh, imagine I too that, uh, that studios would probably get nervous about that because they, they feel like they paid good money to see the stars faces. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely something that happens. I don't think it's always necessarily correct. I mean, if, if the stars' faces are dark the whole movie, that that is a problem. I mean, I'm talking about individual shots, not mm -hmm. um, not the whole film. And I mean, I, my my personal opinion of that is, if you can have really strong photography that feels like uh, just polished and powerful and and you know really cinematic, as opposed to you know, a lacquered veneer of homogeny, um, that that's a better way to show the actors, even if they're dark sometimes, to have your actors looking great and looking like they're in really high end photography, I think makes them look better than um you know, just boring frontal lighting all the time, which also is problematic in itself in terms of um, you know, it can be a slippery slope of once you're doing this frontal boring lighting that doesn't even look like the space, the, the, the space that you're in or anything, especially photographic, then if there is any flaw in it, then that's magnified. And also all you're looking at is the actor because the lighting's not interesting. So if, the, if there's any flaws or whatever, that's going to be uh, even worse, it, it, it seems to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and, and, and also I don't, I don't, also, I just don't, I also don't think that the, you know, just to move away from talking about uh, the front of people's faces being in darkness, because I, I just don't think that's as big of a deal one way or the other as people make it. No movie should have that all the time anyway. Uh, you know, I think that the most flattering lighting isn't uh, usually, is not, depending on the person and the circumstance and everything, is not really flat. It is soft. It's really soft and really gentle and loving, but it's not just flat and frontal, which I think is um, kind of the, uh, a traditional wisdom, maybe not even amongst DPs, but amongst directors. Mm. Do you find that when, when you're lighting actors, do you find that generally the, the, the best actors know how to play to camera that there's a technician aspect to what they do um i think that exists with a lot of a lot of really good actors but it's not a hundred percent uniformity mm -hmm. but yes a, lo a lot of them absolutely yeah they're aware of light they're aware of um uh you know they're aware of light they're aware of the lens they're they're aware of all that stuff um do you have do you have any kind of what what is your level of communication generally with the actor? Uh, it's <clears throat> I mean it's uh, it's specific to you know it, it varies from actor to actor um, depending on how much communication they need and and 
what's going on politically. I mean, if there's some kind of, um, you know, if, if there's some kind of, you know, political issue going on with them and the director or something and things are tense or uncomfortable, I'm not going to step in and start talking about lighting in the middle of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's, uh, I mean, it's just always a, an art and a balance of how much, um, you know, when, you know, when do you, when do you talk to them and how much and, so yeah, it just really depends on the person and the situation, and, and um, you know, and I try to think about, you know, I try to think about the people too. Sometimes even in a lighting setup, like I, um, you know, I might, you know, if I imagine a lighting setup that's a little bit finicky in the sense that somebody has to like, you know, keep their nose pointed a certain way, and then I know it's an actor where that's going to be a problem, and they're not going to want to listen or talk about it, then I might actually do it a, a different way rather than do the, the original concept, you know, spe you know, specifically because of that person. Uh, I mean, things like that don't usually happen, but it, you know, it happens from time to time. You, you mentioned uh, comedy a, a little bit ago and, and no matter who I talk to, whether it be the director or screenwriter or composer or actor, they all say that comedy brings forth its own kind of specific challenges that it's very difficult. Is it the same for, for a cinematographer? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it, it's very difficult in a way uh, different than other genres necessarily, but it, but it is, you know, it is, it is really different. And um, on the one hand, I think that I'm not sure where the convention came from that, comedies have to be really bright and flat and kind of boring, which a lot of the lighting often, I don't know why, but oftentimes lighting in comedies is, I agree that it's a, it needs to be a different lighting aesthetic, but it doesn't, you know, I think you can have rich, interesting lighting um, without it being scary or look like a horror movie. I mean, it can just be rich and nice as opposed to, um, as opposed to just a flat lacquer, um, and, uh, but yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things to think about in, in comedy, not, you know, the, I mean, the lighting, I wouldn't say is difficult. It's just different. I mean, there's, and, you know, it's the same with the, with the camera and the lensing and, you know, you, you know, there's obviously a lot of, um, conventional wisdom that's, that's true about, you know, comedy being looser, um, or, you know, um, looser shots and also just the ability to cut back to much, much more perspective, uh, you know, like, like a perspective of standing back just to kind of show the absurdity. Um, so, you know, there, there's definitely things like that to, to think about. I, I don't know if it's more difficult. It's just different. I remember years ago I was speaking to a director and he said that he got a, a studio note one time that the, he was making a comedy and he, the studio note said, it doesn't look funny. And he said, "Well, I don't, I don't want it to look funny." And, and, you know, and, and yeah, and I think about great directors like great comedy directors like Woody Allen, and and he employs people like Gordon Willis on Annie Hall, a romantic comedy. I mean, something. So, so there, you're absolutely right. I mean, we we have in mind some kind of flat sitcommy look. I think a lot of times for for comedy, and that's yeah, very absolutely. limiting. Yeah, which is totally unnecessary, and you can see, I mean, just like, I mean, those Woody Allen examples are obviously a very singular, and you know, fantastic, I mean, so those are some of my favorite movies ever, but they're also really um, specific, but there's all kind of, you know, comedies uh, that, that that break those those rules of being really flat, and, and um, uh, you know, it just it just makes the movie interesting on, a, on another level, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think it has to be distracting. Um, you know, obviously it would be distracting if it suddenly looked like a horror movie where somebody's like in, in silhouette and then they come forward and then there's like a slash of light across part of their face or something, you know, that, 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 that'd, that'd be absurd. But I mean, that doesn't mean that there can't be, um, you know, richer, interesting lighting. And that doesn't even have to contradict the idea of always being able to see people and, and, you know, and, and it not being distracting. Right. When you you said that you you first met up with with Ryan at USC, um, yeah, what clicked between the two of you? Do you think? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. We, uh, uh, you know, we met when we were whatever, 17 years old, and uh, we had both been volunteering on student films, just helping out. And uh, we'd uh, we'd been working on the same movie, the student film shot on the weekend, so we'd seen each other for the last several weekends and never really gotten to know each other till, till you know, maybe the second to last weekend of this thing. And um, I don't know, we just kind of started talking and then um, we were going to, uh, you know, we both had our um, kind of homemade movies that we would, had made in high school. So uh, we got together at some point after the the film was done and, and uh, showed each other the our films. And, uh, you know, I, sh- I showed him film, this dumb film I had made in high school first. And if, uh, if he would have shown his first, I never would have shown him mine because it was really embarrassing once I saw his... <laughs> His film, I mean, mine was truly just a kid tinkering around, and, you know, his was like a real movie, even though it was uh, a homemade thing when he was 17 years old. Well, and and, and obviously, uh, you know, you guys have worked together throughout your careers now, and, you know, each project is so, so different and brings forth a whole new set of challenges. And I got to tell you, Looper is my absolutely favorite movie of the year i'm i'm crazy about looper oh wow uh, <laughs> but tell me when you when you meet with ryan about a project and say a looper what are mm-hmm. those initial conversations about this this is what i this is what i want this film to be the visual scheme of this film mm-hmm. um well the <clears throat> the uh how ryan talks to me about the camera versus the lighting is 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 very different the lighting um he's a lot less you know specific or technical it's more about um you know it's just more about feel and, and an approach really and then he kind of lets me do my thing i mean there might be specific scenes where he says i want this one to be really dark you, you know i mean he's thought about the lighting uh let me rephrase he's thought about the lighting a lot but in, in a story sense you know so he'll have seen like uh even more than a lot of directors so he'll have scenes where he knows he's like, i want this lit by the window or you know he'll say there's a one floor you know one, i mean in, in brick in the in the pins basement i mean he always said there's one fluorescent light in the top and there's these two lights behind him and he doesn't necessarily have some precise thing that that means how it, it's going to come out um so he'll have he'll be really specific in the story sense of lighting and then he'll give me ideas about the feel and then he's not too technical or, um, and then with, uh, whereas with camera, he's incredibly specific. He, you know, um, before a movie starts, we sit down and he, he, to a pretty good extent, he knows what all the shots are in a very specific way. And, uh, he shows me what they all are. And then when we're setting it up, he'll, you know, he's, you know, specific about lenses and, camera placement and and all of that um so uh yeah so it's a little bit different with uh lighting than it is than it is with camera well and and also the what strikes me about looper as well um is the rhythm of it uh Mm -hmm. and and especially at the beginning it seems i mean there's not a wasted frame uh it's it's mm-hmm. very tight and then you know it it lets it once the story digs in it kind of breathes lets it breathe a little bit but was is rhythm a, a big consideration for you in that piece as a, as a dp um yes but i don't think in the sense that you're that you're necessarily talking about um right there uh i mean i, I think some of what you're talking about is really just a lot of um a lot of work and refinement by Ryan, by Ryan and, and Bob, the editor in editing, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, because Ryan's really, um, he, he's really harsh on himself in terms of cutting fat out. It's not like, you know, he's not one of these directors that falls in love with the stuff and the editor or the studio or someone is saying, come on, we got to shorten this. It's for, you know, he, he, he gets really ruthless with himself in terms of, cutting things down and cutting things out and, and, and trimming. Um, so I think, I think to some extent that's what you're talking about, but in terms of the the pacing, um, you know, when we're shooting, uh, Ryan's stuff is so, 
uh, I mean, he's, he really is like a master of the cinematic language. And, and to some extent, because I've known Ryan since we were kids, I mean, uh, you know, I, I read, a I read the script and, and his script doesn't have any camera direction or, or any, anything. I could, you know, just the same way he is with, with the actual movie where there's no fat, it's the same thing with the script. It doesn't have any, you know, all the scene descriptions really lean. It has literally zero camera direction in it. Um, but, but when I, even just from the script, I can just feel the Ryan style and, and, you know, I can imagine, um, you know, when I read the script, I can kind of tell where all the cuts are because of, you know, between the way that he writes it to sort of indicate that emotionally, not literally, and, and also knowing him for so long, um, y you know, um, so, so it's really, this stuff is really, really strong in that sense. And, um, uh, you know, which is a little bit different with other scripts, especially, you know, when I work with directors and they're not the writer and, and everything, you know, I mean, then, then, then it's a lot more work of we're building that stuff in the, sh in, in the shot list together. Um, well, well, when you're, when you're working with effects, uh, mm -hmm. which, which Looper obviously has a number of effects involved, do mm -hmm. you feel, I mean, the, I'm sure you kind of have to go through the, the pre visualization process for, for some of them, but do you feel constricted at all? Like, like you're restricted in a certain way to achieve those effects in camera or? Or not? Um, not especially. I mean, Looper. I mean, Looper wasn't like an effects movie. I mean, firstly, it just doesn't have as much as many visual effects. I think as it kind of seems like it does. Mm -hmm. um, and but also, you know, I mean, specifically with Ryan, because he knows what all the shots are, you know, way in advance. You know, like I said, they're really designed, especially the the visual effects or stunts and and things like that. I mean, we just kind of you know, to some extent, the you know, the way we do something like Looper is the same way we did the student films with Ryan. He just says what the shot is, and then I figure out how to set it up and do my lighting. <laughs> and, and you know, when there's a big effect, he's talked to the visual effects supervisor, and so have I to make sure that we know what we're doing and what parameters we have to, you know, think about. Um, but, but usually, um, you know, uh, it, it, I mean, Looper didn't feel like doing an effects heavy movie at all to me. I mean, you know, uh, I, you know, I just like I, the movie I just finished was an effects heavy movie and, and, um, you know, that that's different. It's still not necessarily limiting. I mean, you have a lot of things you have to think about and doing a, a big VFX shot is different than doing a, a non VFX shot, but, um, you know, it's you. It, it, you know, it's usually not too limiting. I mean, you might have some specific thing like the the effect supervisor saying, "Don't do a zoom during this shot," or something. But um, you know, it's not. Uh, I, I don't usually find it too too frustrating. I, I actually I wanted to talk to you about because I think the movie that you're referring to is Carrie, the the, the yeah. more effects heavy. We're yeah uh, yeah. We are huge. Uh, the Palma freaks on the show oh. okay, <laughs> so, well, yeah. and you know there's there's very few directors for me that are more kind of visually expressive than than De Palma but uh, but that being said I am so excited about Kimberly's take on Carrie uh, and, and I wanted to know first of all from you what you think kind of distinguishes uh, the vision you guys have for, for, for this for this Carrie hmm um, well, I mean, I can tell you from my point of view, uh, you know, I don't know about, uh, Kim, but, uh, I just, uh, I, I didn't want to define ourselves by the other movie, either positively or negatively. So, um, you know, I pointedly didn't rewatch it. I hadn't seen it in a while mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I didn't rewatch it. So I just, you know, kind of tried to do, um, you know, just, kind of tried to do what made sense to me and, and, you know, designing things that I thought were, um, you know, and, and, you know, Carrie is a lot different than, than Looper in that there was a lot more of, of, you know, especially with the VFX stuff of, you know, it's not something that's figured out in advance. It's not so, something that's in the script. So it was me designing stuff with the visual effects supervisor, um, 
in a bunch of cases. So, you know, so, you know, it would be like, um, you know, like I might come up with a shot idea that was, you know, actually pretty expensive for them to, <laughs> to do. And I'd be like, you know, what, what about this? And they'd, you know, they'd be like, well, this is a fantastic way to show it. We should, we should do it. And then, um, you know, between the, between Kim and the visual effects supervisor and the producer, um, you know, I think we would come up with, you know, cause, cause the, you know, the budget was still limited. And I think, you know, it was kind of cool because a lot of times what we would end up, um, what we would end up kind of cutting as visual effects ideas were, were more minor things and tried to stick to the bigger, you know, try to not lose the bigger ideas. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that answers the question. But <laughs> well, and also like, like Looper, <clears throat> I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm assuming not having seen any of, any of Carrie, but, but knowing the source material uh, mm-hmm. like Looper, I mean, it has slightly, fantastical elements but but the important thing is that that both of these movies take place in the real world that you that you feel it's a world that you, you can be a part of that you live in yeah yeah carrie yeah i mean carrie's uh definitely got got that odd combination of there's kind of a you know telekinetic and magical aspect and then there's kind of a a drama everyday world to it um although it's not completely the real world i mean there's definitely like kind of a heightened or hyperbolic um world uh, you know i don't um i don't think it feels like it takes place in the completely real contemporary high school world there's a little bit of a specific feel to it mm. Mm. let me ask you about your your um before i let you go your approach to technology uh, because a, a lot of a lot of cinematographers, uh, some of them kind of bemoan the 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 death of film, if that's how you want to refer mm-hmm. to it, and others embrace it, and and still others think it's uh, it's irrelevant. I mean, it it all comes down to storytelling, and the technology mm-hmm. is just a, a tool. What, what what is your feeling about film versus digital? Well, I mean- uh, I mean, my feelings are really complex on it, so it's it's going to be hard to reduce it briefly. I mean, I do think it comes down to storytelling, but these are our tools, so it's just whether you want to spend time talking about it or not, because um, it is a big deal in the in certain in a certain sense. I mean, it just depends on what level of abstraction you want to say it, it's important or not. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, like it's not important to the to the world economy. You know, <laughs> like it depends on how far back you want to zoom zoom out. So I, I think at a certain level of uh, zoomed out level about film, it's not that big of a deal, one way or another. Um, if you if you zoom in a little bit, it is, it is a huge deal, and um, you know I think it's really complex. Uh, the the reason that people are absolutely attached to film makes a hundred percent sense to me. Um, but I'm not t- totally of the same school. I mean, part of the reason comes from, um, categorizing it in, in your head as there's two things. One is called film and one is called digital. And, you know, if, if you categorize it that way, and then you just look at the results, you go, well, almost all these films that are called digital look bad or whatever. Um, I can see that, that that's how you would come to that result but the thing is digital isn't a one one format the way film is one format format it's really just a substrate for any number of you know formats and methods and um i think we know that a digital file is capable of making a really good image because nobody you know nobody says that a a a film that's shot on film and projected on film but was color corrected digitally looks um you, you know has been tampered with or is a digital film and yet the image has been stored in a digital file. And I, I think that that alone kind of shows that a digital file is capable of, of storing what we want it to. We just have to figure out how to pack it correctly. And I think that um, with the as the digital cameras have gotten better and better and better, um, I think we're kind of at a level where in terms of, you know, technically speaking, you, you know, pure tech technical, it's, Digital is probably as good as film, but um, in terms of aesthetics, film has 
all kinds of very complex idiosyncrasies. I'm not just talking about grain. I'm talking about the really complicated way that it deals with different wavelengths and different exposures and and all that. It's not very linear or predictable. And, um, you know, some of that's just inherent to the way it is. And some of it is, is stuff that Kodak worked on for, you know, for a hundred years to try to get it to look aesthetically nice rather than necessarily technically correct. And, um, you know, I think, I think if, if we can, um, you know, I, I think, you know, something that I'm interested in doing that I've been even doing a bunch of work on myself is, you know, mapping out some, you know, you know, kind of a map of the, of the different colors that the film makes and trying to figure out a transform between certain digital cameras and film so that you can kind of reintroduce some idiosyncrasy so it doesn't have sort of a, a, a perfectly um, linear response in a way. Right. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I, I don't, I mean, on the one hand, I do think it's sad, but it's, you know, in, in kind of a, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do think it's sad and I absolutely love film and it's the, the you know, it is the one format that's, that you know it's going to come out great. Um, but that's kind of because with digital, you can do anything. It can come out great or it can come out bad. You actually have to control it. And I, and I do think that, um, I guess the short way to say it is that uh, I think that this, you know, the motion pictures moving towards towards digital acquisition is the same as stills going to digital acquisition and, and you know, when music switched to recording, which is I think it's becomes a lot easier to meet the absolute the, the kind of minimum threshold of professionalism and a lot harder to do something really great um, just because the technology is so easy to use at all. But, you know, the whole, you know, the, the, you know, you can't, once a system moves from simplicity to complexity, it'll never go back to simplicity. It might move to a better system of complexity, but it's never, you know, you're never going to get that genie back in the bottle. So, um, you know, it's a lot more complicated to do something, a lot more complicated and difficult to do something really nice. And now you're working in a playing field where almost anybody can be at the min minimum threshold of professionalism. You know, I mean, it used to be a distinguishing factor just to n literally know how to shoot 35 millimeter film. Like, even if you, you know, even if your stuff didn't look good, just the fact that you could do it professionally was in itself a saleable skill, which now it's so easy to just have it come out that that, you know, that's not a, you know, that's not really a, a distinguishing uh, skill, I would say. Well, it, it seems, With digital. W when was the last time you shot film? Was, was, were these past projects shot on film at all? Or? <laughs> um, last time I shot film was... Uh, for the pickups for Looper. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, uh, I mean, uh, what I hear is that, you know, when you uh, when you shoot film <clears throat> as a DP, you don't you don't necessarily know how, with absolute certainty, how your footage is going to come out. I mean, it's at the mercy mm -hmm. of, a, of a lot of elements. With digital, you can kind of <clears throat> paint the image right there on the spot. But, uh, but is that correct? I think one. Um, I think one of the problems is that people assume that that's correct. I think that's actually one of the biggest problems right now. Whereas in fact, um, I mean, I I treat the two exactly the same in the in the sense that I know how I'm exposing it. I know how much information is on there. I don't want to waste time on set doing color correction. I mean, it's just silly. You're just proving to yourself that you can indeed do the color correction that you're going to do later. Mm -hmm. But you already know you can do it. I don't know. I mean, you already don't have enough time to shoot a movie. I don't know why you would sit there on set doing color correction. And when it it's not even permanent or anything anyway, you're just going to redo it later anyhow. So, I mean, if you expose stuff correctly, you're going to have all the information there to do the color correction. So it really the part that you're doing on set is the shape of the lighting. Like where is the light coming from? Um, to some extent, what are the ratios? Obviously now it's easier to adjust ratios and post a little bit, but you, you know, you're never, you're never going to, you know, if you've got the light coming from the, you know, if you have a window in the shot and you, and, and you, you know, you foolishly light it from the other side so that the person is dark, their face is dark on the side where the window is and it's bright on the other side. I mean, you're not going to fix that in color correction. Um, you know, so, 
you know, I think it's silly, and I, and and I think people waste a lot of time with that. And you know, I, I mean, on digital shows, I've said to directors, uh, you know, somebody says, "Is there, too, you know, is there enough light on their face?" I, and I go, "A, a yes, but B, don't don't ever do fine tuning like small increment lighting stuff to a monitor on set, especially if you don't have a, you know, a whole tent and a calibrated monitor and all that, which I don't like to do because that slows the production down like crazy." Um, yeah. So if you don't want to slow it down and you do just have a monitor, that means there, it's not a totally calibrated monitor. There's light hitting it. Um, you know, it's just uh, – so I, I think it's all silly. I, sh I shoot digital exactly the same way I shoot film. I just use my light meter. Um, you know, I use the same lighting ratios. I use exact. I, I use only one lookup table. I don't have anybody tweaking the image on set. And, um, you know, if I do that, then the director's monitor will look great, but I don't like to monitor.